Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Today's episode is about exploring and explaining the different areas of scientific fields that the Human Origin Project will be focusing on exploring. Our approach is to look at science from a multidisciplinary angle, and we also aim to include in this research field ancient legacy and what our ancestors knew and talked about, and can we interpret that in a modern scientific lens. We cross many different scientific fields, including geology and prehistory to evolution and human DNA, archaeological sites and and ancient civilizations, space in the universe, physics, and the human brain and consciousness. These, we feel, are the pillars of our true story, and that's where we will really be uh, exploring and where the the platform and the people that are forwarding this information will be featuring their research into what we really understand about these areas. What you'll find is it becomes a coherent story and the purpose of this platform is to bring it all together. So I hope you enjoyed today's show. Please leave us questions and if you are interested in these areas or you're a researcher in these areas, please write to us and we'd love to feature your work. Hey, Seth, how you going, man? Yeah, good, good. How are you doing? Oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to today uh, because we're really kind of getting into the different categories and the all of the different research areas that we've found many great academics and also uh, people that have written books on all these different banks of knowledge that has become the Human Origin Project. Yeah, definitely. It's really exciting to have this podcast up and running now and, and yeah, really get into what, what it's all about and and sort of going a little bit deeper into the concepts that we were talking about last time. The problem too with a lot of these topics is that you can go really deep in just one of them and it's never ending. That's kind of the beauty of well, the universe is that it's so complex is that you know if you study one little thing, you can just keep going and going and going. And, and yeah, and that's why also I've found with what we've done working on the Human Origin Project is that you really kind of have to ground yourself in your purpose because you can just get lost in one topic, yet you need to be tied to the context, which really is tracing the evidence of where this knowledge came from, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think you can, yeah, before, I I remember before we had the Human Origin Project going, I was sort of going down these rabbit holes of intense information and learning and not really understanding, you know, learning something profound and then then going back to work the next day and kind of being a bit fuzzy as to what that means and what how to apply that but I think having the context now and trying to understand our place in all of this it it really helps sort of uh as a to have as a foundation to build on and to anchor yourself to this information as well that's one thing I've really found interesting is that when especially with a lot of the studying of ancient cultures is that you're feeling that these ideas and these concepts coming to life after being you know, buried underground basically for thousands of years and these very old notions it's it's a very yeah it's a, it, it feels like it taps into a very fundamental aspect of who we are well, that's what i love about it so much is that when i learn about these things it feels like i'm understanding myself at a deeper level and you know really the that's all we're trying to do is we're, we're all just asking the big question of who we are and that's all you know anyone if you boil it all down you know the seven billion humans on planet earth we're all fundamentally asking you know those big questions so what we've really found is that tracing the evidence back is difficult right because there's a lot of people with theories on this stuff but who's got the true story and where is the, where does the evidence lie and that's been a big part of our discussions and also you know a lot of the work of many good researchers and scientists around the world is they've found ways to build out these pieces of evidence and one thing that really kind of prompted our move into talking about this stuff is our visit to Stonehenge and the idea that we don't know who built Stonehenge and then when you look at the principles that it was built upon you start to see a legacy that links to you know astronomical understandings that you know Plato and the Greeks talked about a lot and there was a foundation of which 
you know, we really built upon later. But then there was a fundamental move back to Egypt as well. And when you start to follow these lines of where this information comes from, things start to get murky, don't they? Yeah, definitely. And understanding, you know, seeing Stonehenge, um, but then realizing that Stonehenge isn't the only stone circle on in the world. You know, there's I think there's something like 80,000 documented stone circles found, and most of them are in Ireland. Like, That's a crazy number, isn't it? Yeah, it, and you, it starts to sort of boggle the mind a little bit trying to work out why they're everywhere what what their purpose was i mean we don't we don't know like no one built stone circles now we don't know the purpose of them yeah it's, it's not only those but also pyramids you you think you you know you learn in school that pyramids belong to egypt that's the egyptians built pyramids and then the more you learn about it you, there are pyramids everywhere uh, almost yeah, on every thousands, con- isn't it yeah almost every continent they've found pyramids um and you know, as you as you go back and back and back, you see that they go deep into our prehistory, and so far back that we don't even know who the original builders were of a lot of these sites and these places. Yeah, that really sparked my interest into, you know, particularly with Stonehenge, where we don't attribute that to a culture or civilization because they didn't write, we didn't know who they were. But then you can start to see the principles, and as you follow that back, you really kind of you know, follow into Greece to Egypt, you know, roughly to, you know, 3200 BC, that kind of time range where modern civilization really sprouts up and the Egyptians kind of um, go through a period of, you know, lots of megalithic building and all of the dynastic periods that we know so much, so much about. But then when you go further, things get murky, right? Is You know, when you delve into older sites in Egypt, there's a lot less that you... That attributed to the, you know the periods that go back further, but then so where did this modern civilization come from? Did it just spring up around this time, or you know was it earlier? And then you look at anthropological data, and really the agricultural revolution, which happened at roughly you know eleven thousand six hundred years ago, uh, at the end of the last ice age, that was probably this, the starting point of what we would classify as modern humans, where we began to change our environment, eat different things, our physiology changed. You know, we began to get dental, dental diseases, which is significant because dental um, records remain in the dirt for the longest, and that's what builds most of our information about our human ancestors. And so, yeah, the agricultural revolution begins to be that last point that we can attribute to being, you know, what we would call us, you know, in our modern form, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the really interesting things about looking back to that period is, you know, what were we doing? What, what changed in our minds to start farming and what changed, uh, what, what kicked us into gear to start modern civilization at that time? And you look at the world contextually at that time and there were these huge changes going on at the end of the last ice age. Um, a lot of people think that that's where the, the original flood myths started from because there were these, there's, there's documented evidence in the geological record of these huge mega floods that swept over the world. Yeah, that's... Let's talk about that because that was something I didn't know about. And when I was, I was led into this via the anthropological data on what happens to humans when we go into this agricultural revolution and we start living in, you know, settled civilizations. Basically, we attribute it to this rise from hunt gathering to being settled and manipulating our environment and growing crops and uh, animal husbandry, so forth. Um, but then, you know, there's no explanation as to why that happened, but this geological standpoint really has only come out in the last probably two decades of understanding what was happening on planet earth during that time and the younger dries period which is the a period from 12,800 years ago which is the borderline of the last ice age into the interglacial period that we're in now that's also something we don't often talk about we're actually still technically in an ice age because so much of the planet is covered in ice sheets but what was happening during this transition from uh, you know, where there was far less sea uh, volume on the planet Earth and you know what was happening to the geology at the time? And this has really sprung up relatively recently. Yeah, definitely. I think that was one of the main entry points for me into this was trying to work out why we just started farming and why we started um, you know, agricultural processes. Um, because people don't just start. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the, the our ancestors' shoes. I don't. I can't imagine waking up one day and just inventing 
agriculture. Um, but y- yeah, as you look back at this period in prehistory around 11,600 years ago, there were these insane earth changes going on. And, um, you know, not only was it the planet, well, sea levels rising, ice sheets melting, you know, volcanic activity, there was also uh, species extinctions and human population declines and all these crazy things going on across, not, not just isolated areas, but across the whole planet. And to put into context, so from about 19,000 years ago, we were exiting the last ice age, weren't we? And that slow, that slow melt um, of the big North American ice caps. So most of North America was covered in an ice sheet and or two ice sheets. And at roughly 12,800 years ago, we saw the disappearance of that ice age, which ended, well, actually, there was warming and then there was a big cooling period, wasn't there? Yeah, so so we were gradually coming out of this ice age sort of 20,000 years ago after the peak. Temperatures were were warming globally and things were becoming more stable, almost to the level it is today, um, which would facilitate things like agriculture and um, you know farming and pr- practices like that. But then all of a sudden something happened and no one can explain what exactly caused it, but, it, but something happened at 12, ar- around 12,800 to 13,000 years ago that shot the planet back into the grips of an ice age and temperatures dropped right down again. And that was 10 to 15 degrees. Yeah, in, in decades, which is some of what the, some of the more recent research is talking about. Which when you think about modern climate change and, and the numbers that we're talking about, and this is one of the points that really got me is when you look at the climate data from the Greenland ice cores, and these were scientists that meticulously extracted those cores so they could get that pure ice to read the uh, temperature fluctuations during these periods. And this is where all this data is coming from. And it just shocked me that no one puts this into context of what happens with humans you know humans are connected to what happened on planet earth there's no escaping that and when you look at the fluctuations of temperature that happened at the borderline of the last ice age just before the agricultural revolution you know the the modern global warming patterns we're seeing today are very minuscule aren't they yeah definitely and i i i don't even know how people survive some of these earth changes like that the We'll go into it in more detail in a later podcast about exactly what happened during the Younger Dryas. But um, in a nutshell, there was a from its commencement when that first temperature drop happened. There was around thirteen hundred years of you know Earth changing calamities, and at the end of the Younger Dryas period, um, global sea levels were four hundred feet higher than they were at the start of it. So four hundred. Um, I mean, t- today we're talking about you know if sea levels rise two or three feet the world will change like we're, we're talking 400 feet which is unimaginable every the size of china and europe yeah being, being swallowed by the sea it's just it's unimaginable and not only not only the sea level rising but all of the megafauna that used to live on the continent of north america just disappeared or as so woolly sep- mammoths yeah woolly mammoths woolly rhinos dire wolves um, the earth was a completely different place wasn't it? and i think this is something that um, that I think when we think of Ice Age, we think of the whole planet just being in ice. But realistically, there was far more land exposed and potentially inhabitable land during this time. So basically, North America was like this big swamp land kind of area where, you know, there were these huge megafauna. And you think about modern day Africa, where, you know, elephants and this is where most of the megafauna today lives. Um, but when woolly mammoths and these huge um, like saber-toothed tigers and these kind of things uh, suddenly disappeared because of this breakage in the well, this warming, the slow warming was happening and then suddenly there was this huge drop, 1100 years, that to me you know, that's over 10 generations potentially of howering cold. Mm, yeah, it's, it's and w- when you start, there's, there's evidence of these mammoths, like woolly mammoths which would be the, if they were alive today, they'd be the largest land mammals on the planet. They froze so quickly that the food in their stomach, that, it, that mammals that have been found today still have undigested food in their stomach. So that for something to freeze that big, like they had like five tons or six tons, for something to freeze that quickly must have been a temperature change astronomically. And it affected 
human populations at the time too there are now records of the clovers people who uh, populated north america uh, suddenly disappearing around this time as well and and they're all we know about them you know there's very few records but what we know is that they created these very specialized spear tips that uh, are found up until this point and then even to the point where they were mining um, materials and you know quite a complex culture present in north america which we don't really understand but suddenly disappeared and so it, it speaks to a geological uh, environment that was very very disruptive and what really got me when i was finding all this and you know we were talking about a lot is that how on earth did the agricultural revolution begin after these conditions on earth yeah and lasting for 1300 years that just it doesn't make it, it you can't compute those sort of numbers and trying to imagine how almost at the end almost straight away after the younger dryas ended and we stepped into this relatively stable period of climate that we're still in today um how the agricultural revolution started and how we sprung straight back to relatively stable civilization and that that i remember when we were first talking about stonehenge and looking into it we were kind of i was kind of looking tr trying to trace it back to the first stone circle and that interestingly enough pops up around the same time as this younger dry period end, ends and for those who don't know gobekli tepe is the oldest uh, it's, it's in modern day turkey uh, it's one of the largest stone circles on the planet it's it's kind of um it's about 50 times larger than stonehenge although they've only excavated maybe five percent um it's 12 football fields of, of yeah massive 22 foot and it's, it's stone pillars. I think it's so old that it predates the stones they thought could build it. It's older than the tools, the evidence of tools that could build it. And that that pops up at exactly the same time as the agricultural revolution, right after this, these earth changing events and these huge mega floods. And it just doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make sense at all when you think of the conditions for an evolutionary leap to happen. You would think that resources have to be abundant in order for, well, that's not necessarily true actually, because they can be restricted in order to change um, and put a restriction on uh, DNA um, and certain traits, for instance. But it doesn't make sense that the rise of, for instance, civilization, which is an organized community. I don't know, maybe there is an explanation there that the conditions kind of painted the solution where the, the surroundings where we, we did farm. But for me, 1100 years, of almost harrowing conditions doesn't facilitate you know if we were hunter gatherers before why wouldn't we just be hunter gathering you know and you'd just be surviving right instead of innovating and when you look at in the context of gebekli tepe there is you know vast technology that needed to be understood and um basically implemented in order to build this and as hunter gatherers if you put that much energy into these kind of um, efforts, you're taking it away from your survival skills. So, look, there's an argument there for you know, the needing of agriculture, but do you just say, oh, we need to build these stone circles, so we need to do, build agriculture? I think there's a missing line there. That's something that we've, there's a, a big line of investigation there. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one of the main reasons that, that we've been looking into these old sites as one of our main sort of categories with the Human Origin Project is because understanding these sites is so important, but also understanding the greater picture and the context of when they were built. Um, you know, understanding that there's a link between these earth changes and then the rise of civilization and the first documented evidence of stone masonry and building and metallurgy and all these things coming in a time that they shouldn't, it shouldn't be coming. It shouldn't be, like no one should be able to build that after coming out of these insane earth changing events. Yeah, it speaks to, and especially when you also add the context of what is recorded at Gebekli Tepe, as you say, only, you know, we've barely excavated, you know, for what, 5, 10% of the site. It's 12 football fields um, in, in area. Uh, huge T-shaped pillars that are aligned to the cardinal alignments of the planet. So how do you know, for instance, the cardinal alignments of the planet? Why is that important in a period, you know, there's a lot of question marks there that come up about Gebekli Tepe as soon as I saw it. And 
it it was really taken on by an archaeologist, Klaus Schmidt, and we'll go into this in more detail because his research is just, I think it's really spearheaded understanding this period a little bit better. Uh, but he spent 20 years there and he, you know, really came from a background of understanding these Neolithic sites in Turkey and that there was this knowledge or, you know, that he called it like a, a body of understanding, for instance, of, of um, worshipping the uh, fertility um, the goddesses and so forth. And that there was there seemed to be this this trend that was following in, in the in, in also in the, the Fertile Crescent, where we attribute the rise of the Garden of Eden, the start of modern civilization too. So this is all embedded in what we would call you know, our myths and you know, where we came from as well. And so there's lines of evidence that are kind of coming together here that we don't really understand. Yeah, definitely. And I think the fact that there are astronomical alignments at Gobekli Tepe, you know, from day one, quote unquote, of modern civilization, the fact that astronomy dates back to that time and then you can trace it forward and all these old cultures had astronomy at, at the base of their ideologies and and you know it was almost like a life their lives were governed by the stars and by um movements of, of constellations and um you know understanding equinoxes and solstices and how that relates to agriculture but also how it relates to themselves personally and um you know looking a good example of that is looking at the calendars of a lot of ancient cultures um, and how that we've kind of shifted away from um, an astronomical basis in our calendar system but when you look back to these old cultures like China and Egypt and the Mayan um, their really advanced astronomical knowledge was encoded within their calendar system so that they would always be on track and always be aligned with what was going on in the, in the heavens. Yeah that's been such an interesting line of evidence because calendar systems this, you know, I, it really kind of broke my thinking about a calendar when you understand that, well, it's just a measuring astronomical phenomena. So we're measuring our, the Gregorian calendar, which is what we operate on today, which is actually one of the most fundamental aspects of a society. If you talk to anyone across the street that you don't know or you bump into someone, they will understand what time and date it is. And so it, it's very, it's entwined into how our society functions and so calendar systems systems are the most basic way that you can measure a um, civilization and what you find is that from Gobekli Tepe there is this understanding of astronomical uh, phenomena equinoxes so forth but th it seems to track and this is this idea of tracking this evidence back you know the ice age seems to be a bit of a roadblock in terms of you know how what how much we can understand from what we dig up because there was such a catastrophic context but then all this site pops up with this astro astronomical knowledge and then it suddenly spreads out it spreads into egypt which then spreads into well whether it goes straight into egypt or there are periods between but then you find through the calendar systems and this is why these are so important for instance the um the egyptian calendars systems were was the foundations of the greek systems and they used to measure the start of the year on the rise of sirius the helical rise of sirius where the um the sunrise the star would rise at the same time as the sun um, on the day and that would be the start of the year and their system wouldn't start on an arbitrary date like the gregorian calendar does and the reason why we have leap years today is actually just a fudging method to stop the drift between our solar years and the lunar and the seasonal cycles, which are still drifting. The studies show that we are drifting off our seasonal cycles on our current system. We know that it is, in, it is inaccurate. But these ancient cultures had systems to measure it far more accurately than us. The Dogen um, culture that we mentioned in the first episode that uh, many people have done studies on treasured and understood the calendar system that started with Sirius. And this seems to have connected to a body of knowledge that began or was concurrently used in, in Egypt. And so those calendar systems, it's a very easy way to kind of follow, you know, this understanding. And I think it's really crucial. And that's been a great a great tool to really kind of pull, like, it's so hard at these times because we have so little evidence. And, you know, we're talking about geological research. We're talking about archaeological, anthropological now, when we talk about knowledge and astronomy and these ideas of, um, you know, more advanced 
levels of consciousness or um, higher thinking that p potentially progresses into agriculture, is that related to this understanding of astronomical phenomena? Yeah, definitely. And I, I think I remember learning about the Chinese calendar and, and how they had this really ingenious way of, of reconciling the lunar year. So how, how, um, how many days there are in a lunar year is different to how many days there are in a solar year. But their calendar was what's known as a lunisolar calendar, which reconciles the two. Um, and they did it so perfectly that it, only, it drifted far less than our Gregorian calendar does today. And the way that they measured their new year, which we all know is Chinese New Year, um, the way that they worked that out is still confusing to so many people. I've read so many papers on mathematicians trying to explain the process behind deciding when Chinese New Year would fall each year. And it's, it's so confusing and it's so hard to understand. But they, that was the basis of their culture, was this calendar system that they all understood. It was the second new moon after the winter solstice. And that's the funny thing too, is when you look at our, our celebration of holidays today, there's usually an ancient astronomical basis to it. So for instance, Christmas around the, the time of the winter solstice and also the equinox periods, um, there is a basis of Easter in um, new moon cycles. But then, so the, the Chinese new year is set on the second new year after the winter solstice, which is what we call Christmas. Um, but lots of different calendar systems use these multifactorial um, methods. And so Egypt was set on Sirius, so with the Dogon, so with the Greeks for a long time. It was lost into the Romans, where we sit, sit in the Gregorian calendar, which is less accurate, accurate. And the reason why is because we don't measure the astronomical bodies. When, remember, calendar is a time measurement, and, and time is just the orbit of a body around another body. So our Earth takes, you know, we say 365 point something days to orbit the sun um, but that is affected by other things the moon for instance so that's why the Chinese would use these other measures but it seems to get more complex and the Mayans particularly were probably had some of the most masterful um, calendar systems where they had up to nine counts and everyone knows the 2012 um, date because of its uh its focus around being the end of the world, but that wasn't the end of the world. And when you look at the Mayan calendar, that was just the end of a much larger count. So what they were doing was counting much larger spans of time. And so this was a, a period that was coming to an end roughly 2011, 2012, there's different theories on that. But what they were potentially counting was different astronomical um, phenomena. And when you think about how complex we understand the universe to be, it seems a bit silly that we're just measuring our little rock going around our star, our sun, and that that's the only factor that we contribute in. And the Gregorian calendar is a modified lunisolar calendar. You think of the months, that's supposed to be the lunar cycle, which is a 28, close to 29 day cycle that changes slightly. Um, but it has to be reconciled because all the bodies relate to each other, everything. And if you don't, you fall out of the sink. And I think that that's been something that I've, I've been really interested in learning and researching about is how these ancient cultures revered their calendar and understood their process or their personal part to play within this greater greater um, greater picture that's going on so they're measuring all these astronomical bodies and they're measuring you know stars like Sirius and how our earth relates to our sun and, and how our solar system relates to the galaxy and on these huge scales but then it also relates on a personal level but then it also relates on an even smaller level and there's instances of these ancient cultures talking about things like quantum mechanics and understanding what an atom is and talking about uh, how you know waves turn into particles and in these very complex stories that they tell but when you look back at them I think we we're talking about Hamlet's Mill in the first episode looking back at these old stories finding that there is this astronomical knowledge and this scientific basis to a lot of a lot of their um philosophies and ideas one thing too that it was an idea that really kind of struck me when i was quite young i used to read a lot of kind of um stephen hawking's and um a few other you know physics writers and astronomers and what really sparked me because i was a biology major is that when you understand the atom like an electron orbit orbiting a nucleus it's just like our solar system i was like this is just like 
our solar system looks like an atom, right? And then when you kind of consolidate that into how many star systems and galaxies and the trillions of, well, actually, so when you think about how many um, potential stars there are in our Milky Way, we're talking about billions to trillions, and then how many galaxies there are, the one Milky Way, there are trillions. That is a mind-boggling amount, and that's similar to the kinds of numbers of atoms that fill our body. And when you kind of zoom in, you see these little particles rotating each other. You zoom out, you see these big particles rotating each other. Zoom out, you see these big particles rotating each other. That's what these ancient cultures seem to be measuring, is this these cycles that exist within us, in our atoms, in our fundamental m- mental particles. And the, what we kind of class as quantum mechanics now is the idea is that when you zoom in enough, those little atoms become energy and they start to behave like little photons and energy and they don't behave what in the way that we would reconcile with, for instance, a planet or a... And that's what the divide is between Newtonian and Einsteinian physics with quantum mechanics. We have not resolved that. And maybe it's because we've not resolved this connection between us and the time cycles that are existing everywhere the mind people talked about this they said we are connected to all of this we measure this and you look at their systems and it is astounding how mathematically brilliant and connected they were uh, we've got a series of um we'll be talking a lot about the mind people and investigating their systems but they they talked about how this related to the human psyche and how uh, civilizations they they would be based upon so the day that you were born on depending on the uh, the astronomical alignments of the day would depend on what uh, name that you get. And so each village, you would have all these names. And if you s- come across a person named Fred, you say, oh, Fred was born on this day, which means he's inclined for these certain tendencies. And so people are born into what they are destined to do and that they everyone else knows and they help them into that. Can you imagine a society that would be like that? That's what the mind people talked about. You can't, you can't imagine that. I, I can't imagine that in, in this day and age. And I think for us especially, it's so hard to even imagine a society that lives that way and works that way and um, interacts uh, on, a daily, on a daily basis knowing that we are part of a bigger process of creation and that there are certain things you can do within your life to align yourself to these processes that are going on. And once you understand those and once you understand those not only on the on a macro scale but also a micro scale level it all kind of starts to make a bit more sense in terms of why these old cultures were you know talking about this stuff and why their calendar system would allow them to be in sync with this and and how we've strayed away from that path um yeah it's really interesting looking at 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 that and how you know we can pull ourselves back and maybe by doing so we can understand a bit more about you know our purpose here and what what um it seems like our like these ancient cultures were doing or have been doing for so long yeah the the calendar and the the ancient astronomy i mean you really do find a lot of instances where ancient cultures had higher astronomical knowledge than we do today and but we struggle a bit to attribute that to them but i really feel that we should in order to really understand things you have to you know, reference where information came from. And I really think that, you know, without knowing, for instance, you know, the Mayan calendars, you know, really understanding its its undertakings, you know, they say that it was given to them in a way. And many ancient cultures do say that, that this was a knowledge that was given to them um, right across the planet. And, you know, they talk about a time where there was geological catastrophe, which is now scientifically proven. So it's all kind of spinning into a, a story that, you know, potentially we don't know the full background of what, why mons, our modern society arose in that agricultural um, revolution period. And, you know, principles that we've been using clearly, you know, during that time, you know, have we lost them? Have we, do we, are we in the sense of amnesia? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I, I find that talking on about those sort of topics and then going into things like, uh, our our physiology and you know we're really good at picking apart the body and the brain and the mind and looking at the very individual aspects of it but only now I think there's an understanding coming together of how it functions as a whole and not only for us but on a bigger picture but 
you know, looking looking at things like the brain, and I think we we touched on this last time, um, that these old cultures had this high knowledge of the physiology of the brain and the functions, and they just described these um, parts of the brain that were the windows to the soul or the seats of the soul, and that all seems like kind of you know primitive ideas and things like that. But but now the science is catching up, and there's a lot of a lot of research going into um, sort of proving that point and sort of changing it changes your perspective on these on these old ideas and it's sort of it's nice to get that balance between modern and ancient completely and the 20th century really I think we went through a process of understanding everything in its parts and so when you think about the human brain neuroscience we really thought we'd break everything down you know understand the fundamental neuron or the particle that where this consciousness just flows out of in a very physical um, matter-based um, way but what we found is that as we kind of understand all the different parts of the brain and all its physiological function you know if certain parts do do certain things you know left and right side brain all the frontal lobe is where we um, attribute to a lot of our human kind of functioning and um, a difference between other mammals but what we can't attribute to and it's a very uncomfortable question in science now is that where does the idea of consciousness come from and so consciousness is that sense that goes beyond the brain so beyond your day-to-day thinking what ancient cultures would refer to you know you mentioned the soul you know there's there's lots of different referrals of this they call it energy which does make sense because we know the quantity is energy and that um matter and particles are made up of energy so is there an underlying energy or that underlies our consciousness and we can't explain that at at the moment we cannot pinpoint where consciousness comes from it doesn't come from the brain all of 20th century neuroscience has directed us away from the brain and we've we've understood more about what the brain does but it's more of a tool to use this consciousness rather than a a source of it and then but that flips everything and it's really we'll be exploring this how you know once you kind of flip this idea and this is what ancient cultures seem to be attuned into that we once you flip the idea that we are you know maybe a little bit more beyond just the body that there is a sense of the universe and it's starting to point to, towards all of these very scientific um, fields like quantum physics and you know the the connection between consciousness and what happens at this energetic level uh, and how it doesn't re- we can't reconcile it with our current laws and then you think about the biology between so we talk about the brain so when we understand the complexity of the human brain and how you know but still can't transmit consciousness. We can't find a spot that goes, oh, there it is, there's consciousness. It just doesn't happen. And so what we're now understanding is that when you keep zooming in into your arm, into the thousands and thousands of atoms, you go further and further and further, you get these little particles that behave like quanta and they behave in the same manner with quantum mechanics, such as they do have entanglement with other, an, an atom in your arm will have been entangled with an atom across the universe and this is a very strange phenomenon that we know is true but we can't explain they can tunnel through things like we can break physical barriers um and we can also um you know be in two places at one time in a sense and there's all these different we'll go into further details of this but this really kind of starts to break our very matter of fact way of looking at the world is that there's a lot more going on and each of cultures seem to have had a better understanding than we did yeah and i think that once you do shift your perspective and change and change your understanding that maybe instead of matter being at the bottom of everything we've got we've got consciousness that takes hold as the fundamental aspect to existence once you start thinking down those lines and it's very bizarre and i'm still kind of like wrapping my head around it but you know you try and think about well if all consciousness died if if all humans died out and all animals died out, would there still be matter? And you can't measure that because you can't. There's no way to know if measure, if matter would be there without consciousness. Um, and yeah, the more that the more that I've been learning about consciousness, it's sort of this endless this endless question that we're only kind of now 
people are starting to look into and people are starting to ask about and talk about and it's interesting that the the further back you go that this was questions that seemingly had been answered or, or cultures had spent their entire like egypt is a great example of a culture that would that was built upon these questions you know having consciousness at the top of the pyramid was there was the key you know your your world was revolved around consciousness and that was if you could master that then that that's all you needed to do yeah the it's really interesting we've really rebirthed the idea of accessing consciousness via meditation so today we call it mindfulness and we know scientifically that there are benefits to quietening the mind and just sitting with your consciousness that's what meditation is and meditation uses principles of ancient cultures which that go back through the yoga, um, the yoga practices, and um, Ashtanga, and all of these uh, ancient. Um, they're based in the Vedas and the, these very ancient practices. But they all, what they're doing is they're just accessing, quietening your mind, your brain, to just access consciousness. And we know now that there are benefits to that. So our body, our, our physical biology, uh, has benefits when we seem to just sit and access this consciousness. So. There's a very strange rebirthing happening and there's a disconnect because we can't reconcile it with what ancient cultures seem to use it for and why did they know about this and yet we've just only in the last 10 years or so begun to scientifically understand this and one thing I find about um, scientific research is that it's the first criticism will be about a concept oh there's no published studies on that well you need a person that fully understands the concept to be able to design a study in order for a published study to occur you don't it's very unlikely you're going to for things going to happen by accident sometimes they do you do come by things uh, by accident but first the concept needs to be understood and then you have the community moving that's how science moves forward is that we have this growing area of understanding of what influences what and then we have this uh, publishing of research on, on really understanding the evidence levels of how these p- things interact and the idea of mindfulness and meditation was a long time ignored but as we've moved through an understanding of well consciousness doesn't come from the brain so you know can we reconcile this to concepts that are a little bit broader potentially than just you know a matter-based system and it's it's so important on a personal level especially for me um understanding this context and this broader picture and that um you know there is there are these things going on that we can't explain and these things going on we can't see um but understanding that and bringing that into a meditation session i i've found has been so helpful because you're not you're not you're aware of what's going on and you're aware of what you're trying to achieve and what is and the fact that you know if you t- s- switch your mind over to thinking that consciousness doesn't you know it's more than just your physical body there's something else going on that we still can't really explain um once you get that you kind of get into that mindset things just start opening up and you realize that there is this bizarre world that you can access without even you know without even being able to explain it but that's one of the one of the things i'm really interested in um pursuing and it's just yeah and it gets it gets very confusing but it's very interesting at the same time and there's there's a lot of people really interesting people talking about this um yeah that totally excites me as well and and i've found i'd never thought i'd be sitting here talking about these kind of things but once you kind of get cracked it's there's no going back and then you kind of you know it's really difficult to go back to i mean i had the same thing in my professional career with understanding for instance crooked teeth and and seeing that there is a functional model to prevent all dental diseases in, you know we can prevent orthodontic braces well once you it it really got me into the idea of looking at context and understanding okay so where where do all these things come from and once you start to look at these and break the idea that everything we have today is you know the highest level of knowledge then all of a sudden you're and the, the funny thing too is that it all starts to come to you as well you start to see things in a different light and you know your books start to pop up for instance that appeal to you in a far different way and then all of a sudden you dive into this book and you realize this huge bank of things you didn't know and then it adds to your little 
journey and then you it, that sends out to two other books which sends out to, to four other books which sends out to eight to 13 to <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and, and just knowing that there because these conversations are so interesting and, and they spark something in not everyone but there's like a, a, a huge uh community of people that are starting to you know question this stuff because i i'd never thought about consciousness or you know anything that we've been talking about in depth but now that i've, I've had an insight into it this is all I want to talk about, and it's it's so great that there are so many people coming around to this, these sorts of discussions, and feeling like they're ready to talk about this or that they want to know more because there is, I feel like there is this underlying sensation in people that there is something outside of our daily sort of grind. There is something more that we just don't really understand yet. But there, we, I don't know. You talk, the, you start talking to people, and there's everyone has an instance of something strange that's happened or something they can't explain or they don't want to talk about because it seems so ridiculous but it's starting to become more common now and i find that it's really exciting being part of this movement and having a space to be able to facilitate these conversations yeah it's interesting you know fear really comes about from a lack of understanding and things that i was previously potentially fearful of i I see now is from a lack of understanding as soon as you break open your your um perception to a problem as and you step back and you see where that problem came from you're like oh you just you know see it right here it's like i kind of think of like you know swimming if you're dropped in an ocean and you're just swimming in the dark trying to find somewhere like you're basically just thrashing around until you know hopefully by chance you hit an island but if you are dropped in an ocean and you have a, a, a rope and you just pull yourself back on that rope to where you came from you know, that's going to be a far easier um, journey than just going randomly in nature, isn't it? Um, what's interesting too is that it, it's really kind of progressing through all this understanding is showing that, you know, potentially, you know, everything we know about where we came from, from, from the idea of DNA and evolution, which really is a fundamental, the fundamental, um, I mean, you can argue different things. We've learned a lot about DNA, but when you boil down to what makes you you your dna is probably the most uh, fundamental way that we can uh, record that but so what we're understanding about human dna and how you know what we understand about evolution and all the progression from mendel to darwin to the human genome project in 2001 there is this very very complex story coming out about us and you know it's time to have a conversation about that and you know this is these are based in science now and we can talk about these things comfortably uh without you know you know worrying about being um you know too out there or too or you know crazy in a way but what i think we've really found is that you know i like having these conversations but i like having them based in fact and so it's very important to ground things first and to know that you the sources and the um the information you're getting is reliable and that's really what we created the human origin project for is to give that sound basis as a um as a sounding board really so i think overall you know we we covered a lot of the areas that we'll be talking about and so you can go to the website and read articles on all of the areas we're talking about Uh, there is a weekly email that you can sign up to where we'll give new updates of videos and articles and new research if you follow on social media uh, we'll be covering things that don't quite make the website. The other thing too is we've got lots of c- contributors from around the world that are writing about these people with academic background, people with different types of training. Uh, if you've studied these kind of areas, we want to hear from you. And this is all about building a global conversation about where humans came from, where we all came from. And if you'd like to participate, please write us on the website and you know reach out and follow us on social media. And as well, if anyone's got any interesting people they think would be good to get on the podcast and interview and talk about their ideas drop us a line and let us know because we love having these conversations and and having a place to be able to talk about them with interesting people who are doing interesting stuff it's uh it's really exciting yeah we're going to be doing a set of interviews and um both uh covering certain topics you know where we'll just sit and have a chat on the stuff we re- research over the week but all of the things that the community is researching as well that's really going to be you know what drives this forward is that your ideas out there what people are discovering and feeling is important that's going to really guide the conversation and and you know we're going to be interviewing 
you know, some of the most exciting people in these areas. And um, yeah, it, so stay tuned for future episodes because there's going to be lots of um, different experts and authors and uh, scientists and you know people a little bit outside of the, the conventional realm as well. But um, anyone with good ideas were, uh, were welcoming, welcoming to the platform. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more information, you can read the full transcript, articles, and discussion on our website, humanoriginproject.com. You can visit us on social media at Human Origin Project on Facebook and The Human Origin Project on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness, and harmony.